Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined today over Google Hangouts with two special guests. This is going to be a joint interview and dialogue. And first, I'll introduce our first guest, uh, Hokai Sobel. Hokai, good to have you on the show again. Hello, Buddhist geeks, and hi, Vince. Yeah, welcome. Um, Hokai is a, a longtime friend of the show's. He's a Shingon Vajrayana teacher, and uh, he's based in Croatia, where he's joining us uh, from today over Google. So it's good to, good to have him here. And uh, our other guest is Dr. Pamela Winfield. Um, she's joining us direct from Elon University, where she works as a professor of religious studies. And we're going to be speaking with her today about her book, uh, Icons and Iconoclasm in Japanese Buddhism, Kukai and Dogen on the Art of Enlightenment. So thank you, Pamela, for uh, joining us today. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me. It's uh, I feel honored to be a Buddhist geek. I mean, I know it's official now, but um, I've always been one, but it's nice that it's official. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and maybe we, we could just start off with a few questions for Pamela to kind of uh, get into some of the meat of, uh, of your work and, and of your research and your writing. Um, and I wanted to start with this uh, part of the subtitle, you know, The Art of Enlightenment, mm -hmm. um, and, and see what you had in mind when you used that term, because uh, I got a sense in reading it that it, it has a, a couple different meanings. Right. So, um, Kukai and Dogen on the art of enlightenment. Um, really, I'm using that phrase in its fullest double sense. That is, this book is um, not only an exploration of Kukai and Dogen's theories about icons, um, whether images help or hinder you from getting enlightened, um, you know, their views on imagery, perception, and representation of, of uh, the Enlightenment experience, but it's also an exploration of um, the art of enlightenment, that is, the technique or the methods for becoming enlightened and how imagery uh, may, the role that imagery plays in awakening. Um, this book contrasts or juxtaposes um, Kukai, that is, the 9th century founder of esoteric Buddhism in Japan, um, his views, very pro-image views, about um, the role of imagery in the Enlightenment experience, um, with Dogen's Soto Zen more, um, if not iconoclastic, then certainly minimalistic uh, views about the role of, of imagery in, in awakening. Um, and it kind of brings them together in conversation, but also nuances those, those views um, and, and tries to uh, kind of reconcile these two very strong strains within the Buddhist tradition itself, right? They're both obviously self-identifying as Buddhist. Um, they just represent kind of two poles or two ways of approaching enlightenment, one using images and then deconstructing them, and then one kind of starting off with emptiness and reaffirming form um, after, post-experientially. Um, so that's kind of the, the book in a nutshell. Um, and that phrase, the art of enlightenment, I think tries to get at both, um, both the image, or rather the expression and experience feedback loop, right? Um, that both uh, of these masters are inheriting this tradition, either pro-imagistic or a somewhat anti-imagistic tradition within Buddhism itself, and doing interesting things with them, each in their own ways. Great, thank you. Okay, did you want to jump in with, uh, with yeah, your sure. question or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a good, good, good place to <clears throat> um, I had one thing in mind. Uh, so uh, you you make it clear in the uh, opening chapters of the book that um, the uh, modern approach to textual study and uh, approach to uh, study of art imagery icons have have uh, proceeded uh, and this also applies to the uh, to the uh, 
sphere of Buddhist studies have proceeded almost independently and uh, that uh, studying them side by side and bringing the findings together uh, would surely uh, enrich our understanding of the subject matter. In this case, Buddhism, its transmission, its history, and its practice in the present time as well. So, uh, I was just wondering, uh, how are your, uh, you know, what what are your conclusions after the work you've done? Mm -hmm. uh, how much is that the case, and whether there is a new field opening, namely one that would bring together? the exploration of artistic forms and especially in sacred art and the uh, textual study. Wow, great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that uh, the field of religious studies is now finally starting to pay attention to visual and material culture and not just written texts. Uh, don't get me wrong, I do not think we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think we need mm -hmm. both. Um, and I think um, it's just a question of kind of the history of the academy. How um, in the 19th century, really the Germans, constructed these bodies of knowledge, right? These Wissenschaften of, on the one hand, kind of text-based religious studies, um, and all that philological, amazing expertise that they developed uh, in the 19th century that we have definitely benefited from, um, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, um, you have the, the Wissenschaft of art history, right, which is image-based. And um, these two camps kind of never really talked to one another for over a century. Um, there are some you know, exceptions to that. Um, but usually they're the exceptions that prove the rule. Um, now, I think, today, finally, uh, the field of religious studies is starting to take visual and material culture seriously, uh, and I'm just happy to be part of this, I think, growing trend. Um, there are others, however. It's not just me. Goodness, no. Um, I'm thinking Fabio Rambelli's Buddhist Materiality um, is a brilliant study. Um, and um, we have, on the other hand, art historians, um, say like Pat Graham, who is looking um, at Buddhist, modern Buddhist art, uh, modern Buddhist expression. Um, um, now, her book actually um, was really uh, marketed as a religious studies book because it was so heavily <laughs> um, Buddhist in its content. Um, so any, what I'm saying is that these two fields are kind of, um, I think, starting to restore the historical symbiosis. Um, frankly, with all due respect to the Germans, um, the world is not broken up into the boxes that the, acad that the Academy says they're broken up into. Um, religion, we know that, it, that uh, monks were artists and artists were monks. Um, there's really no... Um, way that you can say that you're only a monk and not doing art, right? It's just um, certainly, in the, especially in these two um, very imagistic uh, traditions of Mikyo on the one hand, that is esoteric Buddhism in Japan on the one hand, and Zen, despite all of its iconoclastic rhetoric, actually is very rich visually, um, yep. right? Um, we know that um, they're doing art as a daily practice even, especially even in the Zen tradition, right? Okay, granted it's in the Rinzai tradition more with the with the Enso practice, for example, or calligraphy as an art uh, as an artistic expression of one's enlightened mind. Um, right? So we know that um, we need to attend to both text and image um, to to have a greater appreciation um, for how Buddhists themselves understood their own tradition and expressed their own um, I would say level or, or uh, their spiritual um, levels of enlightenment, I would say. Um, now, that being said, on the one hand, sometimes they are all inheriting their traditions. So, yes, on the one hand, sometimes idea precedes the image, right? So they have been reading texts about what, or they've been looking at Buddhas uh, and seeing what Buddhahood should look like, right? or they've been reading 
uh, in the Zen ha in the Zen uh, camp. Um, there have been reading texts and actually learning that they should deconstruct all images of enlightenment, right? When you see the Buddha kill him, when you see the patriarch kill him, right? Um, and so they are inheriting these um, artistic slash textual traditions um, and then replicating or creating innovation within that tradition. Um, and so that's exciting to look at. Um, my point is that we need to look at both. You can't separate um, text from image and image from text. Um, Kukai himself, with his theory of monji, right, um, that is kind of pattern letters of reality. Um, he has a very um, elaborate and um, philosophically rigorous um, investigation into the nature of uh, sound, right, the phonetic value and the letter, the kind of the written text, as well as the actual reality of the object, of the referent, right? Um, and he, he goes into great detail about these kind of visual texts, word images, <laughs> right? Um, and his vocab, I'm sorry, his calligraphy as well is, I see this as a, as an expression of his deep kind of linguistic, imagistic take on reality. Um, Dogen is um, a little less concerned with speech. His, for him, it's more breath, you might say. So if you're going to take the Mikyo, body, speech, mind, uh, right, the three secrets of body, speech, and mind, for Dogen, I would say it's body, breath, mind, <laughs> um, if anything. Um, and um, But even with Dogen, he, he conflates these um, sights and sounds of Zen. He, he has kind of a synesthetic, um, um, many synesthetic expressions of, uh, for example, hearing with the eyes and seeing with the ears. So these kind of um, conflations of visual and maybe conceptual <laughs> or linguistic um, dimensions or categories um, are, are also conflated in Dogen as well. So um, my point is I think we need to look at both if we're going to understand, right, what they themselves are, are trying to get at. Um, um, I make no pretensions that I know <laughs> or I have personally experienced um, some of these um, enlightened states that they describe, um, but I do think um, as, uh, as kind of the so what factor, who cares about text and image in Buddhism, well, I think it can help us to get a fuller picture of the gestalt, right, of, of what these Buddhist masters are trying to get their students and their, their disciples to see. Um, but I actually look to you, Hokai, to, to speak to this more from the practitioner's perspective. I, I make no pretensions that I have experienced kaji on the one hand or shinjin datsuraku on the other from either Kukai's or Dogen's perspective. So. Um, I, I perhaps I, I leave that. Uh, th this is speculative on my part. I leave the rest to to you practitioners. Nice, and we, we'd like to get into you know kind of having a more open um, conversation about you know the inside and the outside of, of these different things because it's really fascinating, and, th and that's why we um, invited Hokai in for this conversation because he's one of the few people I know that is a uh, pra practice in this. You're calling it the Mi Mikyo school. Um, so I wanted to ask a kind of follow-up question too around what you just said because um, you know Hokai, you mentioned there's been an emphasis on the textual study over the art, and it also seems like um, you know connected to that there's been an emphasis on Zen over this Mikyo Buddhism, and I wonder if that's connected. Um, you know the reason that Zen has gotten such a you know I mean, obviously there's a lot of reasons, but I, I wonder if you could speak to that a little, Pamela, you know your perception of that. I'm sorry, me or to Hokai? Uh, maybe, maybe to. I'll, I'll start with you, and then if Hokai has some extra thoughts, it would be cool to hear, hear his thoughts too. Ah, okay. So, why Zen has received such extraordinary reception in America as opposed to perhaps Mikyo, this esoteric form? Um, well, um, as you say, there are lots of reasons for this, mm -hmm. um, historical, um, starting in 1893 at the World Parliament of Religions and how Shonsaku, uh, so in Shaku, excuse me, um, kind of presented Buddhism to the West. 
um, as kind of a pure philosophy, um, devoid of any kind of smells and bells, ritualism, um, and that resonated with its Protestant um, audience, right? Um, yep. And so it really was kind of a, a perfect example of, of reverse Orientalism, that he kind of gave them what they wanted to hear um, yep. in, in that regard. Um, so, um, yeah, there are definite reasons why Zen has taken off, at least in America. Um, it's interesting to think about, say, more Catholic countries like France, which actually um, courted Shingon Mikyo much uh, to a greater extent than, than Protestant America did. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, Mikyo is Catholic and Zen is Protestant. I, I don't want to go that far. But there did seem to there do seem to be um, perhaps some family resemblances or or that resonated with with what people um, kind of came into the room wanting to hear. Let's just say that. Um, so why what you know? So that's on the one hand why Buddhism. Uh, I'm sorry. Why Zen really took off in America? Um, this book that I've that I, this comparative study um, tries to <laughs> maybe uh, establish a middle path <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, between you know the deconstructionist revisionist Zen scholarship that has been coming out that, for example, completely um, deconstructs and dismantles Suzuki Zen. Right, um, it's kind of a knee jerk uh, reaction and waking up and realizing, oh wait, no, Zen really does have rituals, and oh wait, no, Zen really does have imagery. Um, and it's really kind of um, 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 deconstructionist and, and in many ways I think negative. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to um, appreciate and valorize and acknowledge um, the Zen tradition Again, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just bring um, bring Mikyo up on a par, perhaps, with it, um, and, and kind of raise the the profile of Mikyo and say, "Hey, look, these are two um, competing or two alternative um, uh, versions of Zen. One that uses imagery but deconstructs it, empties it out of substance, and one that um, privileges, you know, the experience of Shinjin Datsuraku, right, of, of dropping off a body mind." Completely, um, but then reaffirming form after. Um, so, um, um, as a comparative project, I'm hoping that we can broaden our understanding of Buddhism in America as not just Zen, and it's not just you know minimalistic um, anti-image <laughs> um, sort of stereotypes that that I think maybe some people are still operating under that Suzuki Zen or are deconstructing and saying, no, Suzuki had it all wrong. So I want to affirm and nuance. Cool. Hokai, any, uh, any additional thoughts on, on that one? Well, I think, yeah, I think Pamela covered uh, the, the most important points. Uh, there were other, of course, historical uh, uh, conditions or circumstances uh, more more precisely, that uh, facilitated uh, the spread of Zen uh, in the, uh, especially later uh, after the Second World War II, uh, during the 60s and 70s, which was, you know, historically speaking, a very short window um, to to have such a strong cultural impact, uh, not just in America but also in Europe and uh, elsewhere, wherever the Euro-American culture, you know, geographically reaches, and uh, you know, the Southern America and Australia and other places. Uh, it was that that kind of influence was uh, quite independent from from the uh, uh, from whatever Buddhism uh, was practiced by the Japanese diaspora anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and as Pamela noted quite correctly, uh, not just Soen Shaku, but many, many later, uh, Daitaro Suzuki and many later uh, translators and uh, Zen teachers uh, in, in America and Europe have, um, have uh, skillfully played on ideas of German idealism and German romanticism 
to uh, you know to produce uh, resonances and uh, agreements and recognitions in the Western audience, and uh, w one of those one of those strong ideas was uh, a very Protestant kind of uh, doing away with uh, ritualism, doing away with uh, too much emphasis on text on on text or reliance on on text, uh, and also uh, doing away with uh, with an uh, overemphasis on institution, which you know nowadays, of course, we know that in Zen there's also a huge uh, tradition of textual study and uh, a huge accumulation of of commentaries uh, in every generation, and there's also uh, uh, a lot of uh, ritual involved uh, to mark off different stages in practice on you know on daily basis. Uh, and also uh, there's a, a very strong institution and lineage so that uh, but but that rhetoric was very very successful uh, on the other hand uh, Shingon uh, and generally Mikyo which the, the the term Mikyo that that uh, Pamela uses doesn't refer just to Shingon it also refers to the esoteric uh, uh, branch or uh, esoteric uh, aspect of the Tendai school in Japan, and as, as well as some uh, smaller uh, uh, movements uh, that are more lay oriented, and uh, the Mikyo uh, Japanese tradition, because of its very strict, mostly that's the that's the main reason, because of its very strict uh, initiation and transmission protocols, and uh, a uh, reluctance to uh, leave the uh, safe and secure borders of Japanese cultures uh, has basically missed the opportunity to uh, take the advantage of 60s and 70s. Um, you know, as some other people have said, if there if there hadn't been an invasion on Tibet, who knows? Maybe maybe even Tibetans uh, wouldn't have used that opportunity so uh, efficiently. Mm. Okay. Cool. So, so that was that was a very that that was a very strong uh, uh, you know negative uh, factor. Uh, while you had uh, half a dozen of very very active uh, Zen masters uh, roaming across the American continent, and at least uh, three or four uh, in Europe uh, who basically took permanent residence, uh, you had no such you know uh, personalities except for one or two. Exceptions, uh, the Shingon and Tendai teachers only, you know, uh, uh, intermittently visited West and uh, didn't exert such a strong influence. And uh, as I said, didn't make good use of that uh, window of opportunity. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, I want to go back to the to the book a bit and uh, to, to the idea that was for me most exciting and interesting. Um, and and this was the idea that there, in some sense, these two people, um, Kukai and Dogen, were expressing two different paradigms of enlightenment, or two different ways of, of expressing or experiencing it. Um, and uh, Pamela, I was wondering if you could start off by sharing a bit about um, these two different paradigms and kind of how how they're different, you know, how they're unique, um, and, and kind of what, what they are from, from your point of view. Uh, great, thanks. So I think you're referring to uh, the unitive model versus the purgative process? Exactly. Okay. So yeah, that's my how I try to characterize what I think is going on um, in, in their uh, respective, um, as you say, paradigms. So let's start with some stories. Um, in the Mikyo, that is the Shingon, esoteric uh, foundation legend, um, the esoteric transmission gets um, bestowed to the human race um, in a, that is, to Nagarjuna, the, the first, uh, which they recognize as their first patriarch. And Nagarjuna receives the two esoteric sutras in an iron tower in southern India, and he receives it from Vajrasattva. Um, and these two sutras are the basis for the kind of paradigmatic uh, two-world mandalas um, of the esoteric Shingon school. 
Um, so he, with it, when he enters into this um, iron tower, it's kind of a magical, mythological space, and he, within the tower are housed all the thousand Buddhas of past, present, and future. So in that um, foundation legend, we have kind of an expression of time encapsulated within sacred space, you might say. So it's kind of a spatialized time. That's one story. Let's look at the Zen foundation legend. In that story, Nagarjuna, again, um, actually receives the Pranyaparamita Sutras, right, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, um, at the bottom, at the Dragon King's Palace at the bottom of the ocean. And so he must travel down through the depths of meditative awareness, you might say, to obtain wisdom and then re-emerges, resurfaces as the holder of enlightened wisdom. So it's a process, not a place, really, that um, Nagarjuna in the Zen tradition, uh, that Nagarjuna um, obtains. Um, so instead of having it spatialized time, there's kind of a temporalized space. So it's the process of Nagarjuna going, starting from everyday reality, right, an assertion of form such as they are, to a kind of a great death, a great drowning, a going down and dropping off, as, as Dogen calls it, um, and then resurfacing, a re-emerging, so a reaffirming of form afterwards. So it's a tripartite uh, affirmation, negation, and uh, reaffirmation of, of form in the Zen story, okay, in the Zen foundation legend. Um, and I use these foundation legends as kind of paradigmatic anecdotes um, to try to illustrate um, the how Kukai on the one hand and Dogen on the other um, envision the enlightenment experience. In Kukai's um, model, there is the um, idea of kaji, or which has been uh, translated as mutual empowerment between self and Buddha, right? And Buddha being Dainichi Buddha, who is the personification of the world body, Dharmakaya, uh, personification of emptiness, actually. Uh, but it's a personified um, figure, right? And you actually visualize Dainichi, and you have kind of a divine union a unitive model going on with Kaji in the Mikyo context. By contrast, in the Dogen Zen, uh, more kind of process-oriented model, um, you have that tripartite assertion, negation, and reaffirmation of form, that, that three-fold, um, um, you know, <laughs> what could we say, process theology, but um, there's no theos there, so uh, I can't say that. But, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, tripartite, um, very Majamikan, um, very Baba Videka like assertion, negation, and reaffirmation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's a purgative process, not a unitive model. Um, then what I do in the book is um, try to actually. <laughs> marshal some other evidence to help us explain maybe some of these uh, accounts throughout history that um, um, talk about, you know, divine union as opposed to dropping off of self and other, right? That, that second movement of, of absolute kind of nothingness, as Nishida would say. Um, that absolute uh, shinjin datsuraku, where there's kind of no thought, no mind, no self. Uh, absolute kind of suspension of, of um, space-time um, awareness. Um, and what I found was that uh, some of the um, brain studies, actually, so there's some um, neurological uh, or neurotheological um, evidence that actually does articulate um, and have, there are brain scans, actually, um, that kind of show what's going on, perhaps, uh, neurologically in some of these um, accounts of, of altered states, you might say. So I looked at um, uh, Dekelian Newberg's work at UPenn um, that, are, that have um, taken functional um, MRIs, I'm sorry, they're PET scans, um, of uh, Christian contemplatives as well as Buddhist meditators, um, advanced Buddhist meditators, it's not just 
not just novices. Um, and um, when the, for example, when the Christian contemplatives uh, feel like they are almost at the height of their uh, meditation or their prayer, um, they actually inject, they, they pull a little string and, and um, some radioactive um, um, tracers are actually automatically injected and it, it kind of takes a snapshot of their brain um, right then. Uh, same too with the, with the Buddhist meditators. Anyway, what they found was that um, the, uh, the, the contemplatives who used kind of via positiva, that is, um, used imagery as a, focal, a focusing agent first, um, reported that parts of the brain shut down, um, that there was um, a feeling of absorption, the, the orientation area in the, the back, um, I'm sorry, in the parietal lobe um, kind of shuts down and that helps to explain how the image can have a feel, um, sorry, let me start this over, uh, that when this area of the brain shuts down, there is a sensation that one is absorbed completely into the image. So this is uh, an expression of that divine union, you might say, or that union mystica in the Christian tradition. Um, on the other hand, there are other uh, experiences um, that they have actually taken snapshots of, right, where that orientation area in the brain completely shuts down, like in a nanosecond. And this might help to explain um, accounts like Dogen's where you know, it's Shinjin Datsuraku. There's just dropping off of, of self completely. Um, now, I have problems with Dekili and Newberg's conclusions because they say that only this divine union happened in Christianity and only this absolute negation happens in Buddhism, right? And when I think there are, that there is evidence in both the Christian and Buddhist traditions for both kinds of, of uh, experiences. Um, but anyway, I found that kind of uh, that research into neurotheology really interesting because I think it might help to explain maybe what's going on with Kaji as opposed to Shinjin Jatsuraku. That is, that mutual empowerment uh, between Dainichi and self, right, that, that one visualizes, right? You actually um, circulate. You visualize mantras circulating through the body of your own body and going into Buddha's body and then circulating back into your body. And so there's this mantric link, linkage, unity between you and Buddha, right? And you visualize that as opposed to this kind of nothing <laughs> of Shinjin Datsuraku in, in Zen, or in Dogen Zen, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so that unitive model um, versus that more purgative process that you know, starts off with form such it is, as it is, um, radically negates it, but then reaffirms it again, um, I think um, is, is interesting. <laughs> and actually I'm going to probably um, toss it over to the practitioner, to, to you, Hokai. Um, does this make sense to you as a practitioner with a background in both Zen as well as Shingon? Yeah, well, uh, my my exposure to Zen was mainly through its uh, Chinese uh, ah. e equivalent ah. Chan, uh, but but with a teacher who combined the Lin Chi and uh, Tao Tung, or the equivalent of Japanese Rinzai and Soto lineages, so uh, and it was rather brief, just a couple of years, uh, but yes, uh, to a to a great extent. Uh, the complementar uh, nature of the approaches is quite evident, especially in the early stages uh, of training. Uh, I would I would argue, however, that uh, towards the uh, more advanced uh, application of the disciplines, we find uh, a loosening of those contrasts, uh, because uh, in the in the in the Zen training more and more emphasis is put on maintaining the body-mind drop uh, uh, as, as a no-reference uh, uh, basis for practice in everyday life. Uh, and it's a different state when you 
to use uh, to use an old uh, phrase uh, uh, chop wood carry water uh, w without reference to self uh, then when you silently sit and do nothing without reference to self that's that's a very qualitatively different experience uh, the daily activity in this uh, perpetual spontaneity and si in inner silence being a very active and interactive dynamic uh, state while the sitting meditation being mostly a passive uh, receptive state uh, and on the other hand in Shingon practice uh, while the uh, ritual of establishing an external uh, representation uh, an embodiment as you said of uh, not just emptiness but also dependent origination in union uh, as, as, a, as a main deity with which one establishes a spiritual umbilical cord uh, mm -hmm. composed of uh, sacred letters circulating uh, as, you, as you chant your mantras and as the deity silently uh, replies uh, the same mantra and as these mantras circulate around the heart and uh, through the head and through the belly of the deity and out of the mouth of the deity and back into practitioner's own body that is only a stage in the internal ritual in the next stage uh, uh, both of these bodies are actually fused uh, as, as one uh, so that one dones all the attributes of the deity in first person uh, and in the next stage that fusion is dissolved uh, so that uh, you, you know there's there's a, there's a very strong emphasis on using uh, uh, the, the image an internalized image but also an external image uh, you, you do that usually in the presence of the mandalas and in the presence of many other ritual objects that d demark the ritual space in which the meditation happens uh, but then as you move forward and especially as the emphasis moves towards later uh, state, uh, later phases in practice uh, the reliance on an external uh, embodiment uh, and the reliance on on this uh, you know literal uh, uh, duality of practitioner and and Buddha uh, is is more and more challenged uh, and then uh, you know gradually let go of uh, so that one uh, internalizes and then even dissolves uh, the the sense of internalization uh, coming to a point which very much resembles uh, the uh, uh, chop wood carry water phase <laughs> in, in, in Zen practice <laughs> where uh, uh, for example, uh, I, I've seen uh, my own teacher, uh, a Shingon master, a native Japanese, uh, perform a very simple calligraphic practice each morning for two hours, as as a basic as a basic discipline. Um, you know, after all the rituals are mastered, uh, a person finds something very very simple and basic by which to maintain. Uh, a, a sense of presence, awareness, precision, balance, etc. Lovely. I'm also thinking, I couldn't agree with you more, I think both Kukai and Dogen are ultimately coming to the same realization of form and emptiness, right? Um, that it's just, in the beginning at least, in terms of the art or the technique of becoming enlightened, I see Kukai as having kind of a reciprocal understanding of form and emptiness, right? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. It's kind of a, those are coterminous or um, uh, co-equal terms so that this cup, right, of water ultimately already is empty and I just have to see this, right? Yeah. Um, for Dogen, in terms of the art of enlightenment, it's more of the process of starting with form, emptying it out, and then coming to see it as empty form. <laughs> but I think ultimately they're coming they have the same understanding of form and emptiness, maybe just coming at it from the form side or from the emptiness side. Well, they are they are definitely going through through the same uh, through the same stages, yeah. uh, but using perhaps uh, uh, using perhaps different arcs uh, to get there. Uh, 
yeah, where where the where the uh, uh, relative emphasis uh, is is different. Uh, but you know, in the end, I think they would both agree that uh, to give uh, to give uh, to give more uh, importance to either form of emptiness would miss the entire point because they are uh, ultimately synonymous. Uh, form is form is nothing else than an instantiation of emptiness and emptiness is that which which is concealed in the depth of every form but which makes the form functionally possible possible in the first place, uh, yes. yeah if 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 the form wasn't empty it would be an absolute fact uh, and it would be impossible to establish interactions to anything uh, to anything else because you know interaction uh, implies uh, a two way uh, influence between between two things and two humans etc uh, That's right. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, I, I would, I would also uh, maybe uh, bring bring in uh, another uh, dimension of this, and perhaps you uh, could say something about that. It comes to mind that Kukai and Dogen uh, functioned, uh, you know, w were active as teachers in different periods of um, Japanese history. Uh, they were uh, a little bit uh, 300 years apart, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, Kukai functioned in the late uh, uh, late uh, 8th and early 9th century, and uh, Dogen uh, was born in 1200, right? And uh, so he was most active towards the middle of the 13th century. So we could say 400 years uh, apart. Uh, maximum, and they also visited China in a in a very different period of Chinese history, uh, where in between Kukai and Dogen there was a huge uh, anti-Buddhist uh, period, uh, and and uh, and 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 the chain of of uh, uh, at attempts to uh, uproot uh, uh, the uh, strong influence of Buddhism in China. Uh, wherein also the esoteric Buddhism in China was nearly completely uh, wiped out, at least institutionally. Uh, so, uh, uh, also by returning to Japan, they both uh, uh, returned to a very different country. Um, whereas uh, in Kukai's time, it was his uh, prime prime object to to establish a, a, a relationship with uh, the uh, emperor's court uh, in 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 Dogen's time it was a very different uh, time where uh, actually Dogen tried to stay away uh, from uh, uh, from uh, certain aspects of politics and where in the Kamakura period uh, he he had to uh, you know, he had to meet and uh, respond to a very different social uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, do, do you see that also reflected in their work? Thanks for that observation. Yes, absolutely. The historical circumstances surrounding Kukai and Dogen could not be more disparate. Um, they are two uh, intellectual giants for their ages. Um, the Heian period um, go, and Kukai going to Tang Dynasty, uh, China on the one hand to study esoteric Buddhism, and then Dogen's case, you know, 13th century um, uh, Kamakura period and going to Song Dynasty, China to study Zen. So yeah. historically, they have nothing to do with one another. Absolutely, I recognize. Yeah. Um, in but in terms of, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Uh, did you? Uh, my question was: uh, Did you specifically in the in the in the reach and range of the work you did uh, and and the issues that you focused on? Did you did you recognize that that disparity and the reflection of very different social circumstances in which they functioned? Most definitely, most definitely. Um, the one the way I kind of glossed it in the book was to uh, examine their claims upon returning from studying abroad in China. In Kukai's case, he comes back, uh, he went abroad to study the way and he came back fully equipped. That's a letter, that's a quote from a governor of Sanuki's letter. 
um, that was in 806. Um, when Dogen, by contrast, returns um, in 1227, he very self-consciously and deliberately says, I went abroad to study away and I returned empty-handed. And this is, right, um, playing on all the generations like uh, of Buddhist masters like Kukai who had gone to the continent and came back with all the latest R&D, basically, right, all the latest um, uh, texts and techniques and images um, from the continent and re-importing them back into Japan. And Dogen very kind of, as I say, self-consciously says, I came back with nothing but emptiness. Now, of course, he didn't. He came back with yeah. lots of stuff. Well, not lots. Not as much as Kukai. He, yeah. Kukai actually blew a 20-year government stipend in two years on all this, uh, this treasure trove of, of mandalas and texts and, and uh, ritual implements, um, much to the, the emperor's dismay. But um, Dogen is, is, um, knows what he's saying, and he's, um, he's definitely messaging that he's got something um, more than just sutras in his tool belt now. Right, he's coming back as the holder of enlightened wisdom. Um, he has yep. experienced, he has tasted emptiness, um, and that is what he is going to transmit. Um, so, in their works um, and in their agendas, really, um, this kind of plays on um, um, my larger um, observation that you know the Kukai's Mikyo spatialized times. He really wants to ground a new form of Buddhism in Japanese soil. He's going to construct. He's going to build it up, literally, in, in its spa all of its spatial, visual, material forms. For Dogen, the agenda is different. I think he wants to extend and perpetuate the lineage in time. So his agenda is not so much um, the, um, the buildings and, and the, the institutional um, or visual material culture of Zen. It's his, I think his preoccupation is um, uh, following his master's um, admin his master's uh, charge to go and extend the the Dharma in Japan, right up in the mountains, not to uh, not to stay in dusty gray castle towns, right, but rather mm -hmm. to go up into the mountains and train a few select or even a part of a few select disciples and ex and uh, and maintain the Dharma. Um, so his um, priority is to extend the lineage through time, um, and his notion of time is very idiosyncratic to boot, because once you have the true Dharma eye, right, once you um, become a Buddha, basically, then you are automatically united with all past Buddhas, uh, actually past, present, and future Buddhas. He has a very interesting um, trans-historical non-linear vision of time, um, mm -hmm. in Dogen's case. Um, so that's really interesting. So in terms of their overall works, in terms of their overall um, agendas um, and their oeuvre, you might say, um, I do see a difference. I see um, a definite um, focus or emphasis on um, the spatial aspects of Mikyo versus the temporal aspects of Zen. Okay, cool. Here's a, uh, we've got a, que a good question here from, from someone who's tuning in live. Um, so this is from uh, John Simon, who I know personally and who's an artist himself. Um, he said, can you address the difference, and I'll throw this out to both of you and, and you can each respond however you like. Can you address the difference between how the two schools used imagery in teaching how they each saw the role of image in practice. Okay, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, in Zen, image is uh, not done away with completely. That's definitely the case, but it's used in more indirect form. The uh, the examples being, uh, of course, in the ritual context, the uh, images of patriarchs and lineage masters which hang on the walls 
uh, the uh, practice of uh, drawing Enso in Japan or the famous circle with a brush uh, uh, which is a, a calligraphic uh, one dimension of calligraphic practice in Zen schools uh, and uh, also an example being the famous uh, 10 ox herding pictures and uh, some other versions which have uh, le lesser amount uh, of pictures in, in, in the same sequence uh, but so th definitely in Zen there is a place for using images uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, metaphors on one hand uh, as uh, instantiations in the case of Enso on the other hand instantiation meaning a direct representation of something that is not just a symbol but also an example uh, an immediate example of it uh, which which somehow more efficiently demonstrates the energy of the performer in the case of Enso uh, it is believed that the movement uh, can be very skillful and yet cannot completely deceive someone who knows how to look and that uh, the, uh, the, the, the the specific uh, uh, stage of uh, wakefulness and the specific degree of presence can be directly detected through the quality of the movement and the trace left behind by the ink so yes there is a place for for uh, image uh, in in Zen both in the in dynamic form of uh, creating images and in the static form of hanging scrolls on the walls but uh, you know uh, perhaps a little uh, st stereotypically uh, speaking the heart of a Zen temple is the meditation hall which is uh, again uh, expectedly almost completely empty uh, or if it's not empty it's not uh, you know filled uh, with with too much uh, uh, distractions uh, on the other hand in the example of, of Shingon practice and the specific environment in which this practice takes place uh, Shingon temples are filled to the brim uh, especially the especially the place where the uh, where the uh, uh, more advanced uh, practices take place with a seat with a three-dimensional mandala setting uh, with a platform in front of the practitioner with two mandalas on the left and right hanging uh, one with 414 deities the other with 1416 deities uh, in front of uh, the practitioner then there are uh, uh, eternal cos uh, cosmic Buddha uh, represented uh, uh, either in in human form or in symbolic form of an object or as a resounding silently resounding letter uh, so-called seed syllable uh, then on one side in the front there is a burning body of a uh, uh, wisdom king with a terrible appearance on the other side there's the patriarch staring at you uh, there are so many figures present in the immediate space around the practitioner uh, even when you are completely alone you are surrounded from everywhere and the the, the instruction I received uh, when when internalizing these innumerable presences was imagine the space in all directions around you is filled with Buddhas just as a jar is filled with sesame seeds it means there's no free space left anywhere everything is filled to the brim so uh, the the image you get there is is very very different and the uh, the employment uh, of, of images in in Shingon uh, practice both externally and internally is very very rich and very varied uh, images are used uh, both to uh, both to to concentrate one's mind uh, secondly, to uh, to uh, to produce a certain leaning uh, in mind because of the quality in the image. The image may be pacifying, the image may be terrifying, or the image may be symbolic, abstract. Uh, so uh, then, images are used as uh, as forms of silent sound, such as when uh, letters are visualized, either moving or or static. Uh, images are then used as uh, as uh, ways of uh, reimagining oneself. So, in 
many many different ways but eventually all images are let go of and uh, the uh, the as I would say the, the the supreme state would be one of spontaneous uh, experience that is not structured by uh, superimposition of images uh, so that <clears throat> As I've pointed out before, uh, even though during the course of practice very different uh, emphasis may be recognized and the case made that the two approaches are uh, uh, opposed to each other, uh, as you keep moving along, uh, there is more and more uh, uh, reaching a, a, a meeting point, basically, where, uh, where the, the, the practice experience on one hand, and the natural spontaneous unfolding of of uh, everyday experience need to be reconciled, so that even Zen and insistence of dropping body mind must give way to, uh, you know, carry wood chop uh, chop wood carry water. Sorry, and on the other hand, the Shingon insistence on the imagery, uh, allegory, symbol, uh, fantastic, you know, uh, visionary. Uh, uh, I imagination must also uh, be reconciled with with simple uh, everyday actions. So uh, there you have it. That would be my my take on this. Nice, thank you, uh, Pamela. Anything you wanted to add to that? Um, maybe just uh, one one footnote um, mm -hmm. in terms of how Dogen um, used imagery to teach his students. Right. Um, there was the practice in Song Dynasty China um, and in, by extension, in Japan of using uh, master portraits as uh, kind of posthumous doubles for for um, for a departed master. Um, and so this, in Dogen's view, um, led to mistaking the bat for reality. Right. Um, that the the students. Uh, maybe viewing these images of the master in the wrong light, not with the true Dharma eye. Um, and that he is very careful and um, uh, clever, actually, in many instances, um, by, um, by inscribing uh, poetic um, inscriptions on the master portraits themselves um, to kind of deconstruct, um, for his students, deconstruct the power of the image. So you have a picture, for example, of Dogen himself sitting on his Dharma seat, uh, but on you know uh, at the top of the hanging scroll, you have poetic inscriptions saying, "Don't take this image of me. I am not the poster child for <laughs> enlightenment, right? Don't take this image at face value. Um, it's just an image, right? Uh, it's not the real thing." So he's very careful. Um, there's a whole there's a section in the book that I call um, that I talk about this. Um, there's a kind of visual uh, mimesis, but a textual nemesis or nemesis, right? That there's an undercutting textually of the visual messaging. So Dogen is is very careful in um, trying to teach his students um, to to resist um, the treachery of the image, you might say. Um, in Kukai's case, um, conversely, yes, he does say that these mandalas, for example can enlighten in a single glance, right, that they are powerful. In some cases, um, they actually uh, communicate the Dharma better than words can in some instances, right? Um, at the same time, in his poetry, um, Kukai will deconstruct these mandala palaces as but castles in the air. So they both kind of uh, use imagery very skillfully. I would say they both use them as expedient means. Um, uh, but I, I would agree wholeheartedly with Hokai um, that they ultimately, I think, arrive probably at the same place. So. Mm. All right. Well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It would make things easier for us. <laughs> cool. Th thank you guys so much for um, for joining us, and uh, it was great to 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 kind of explore the, the scholarly work of yours, Pamela, and also, you know, exploring it from a practitioner side and, and just getting into what's clearly a really rich and, and um, uh, beautiful, uh, visually beautiful traditions. So, uh, yeah, thank you again for, for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, totally. Thank you for having us, yes.